1848 was one of the most revolutionary years in history. From France in the West to Hungary and Poland in the East, almost the entire continent of Europe was swept with a wave of revolutions that threatened to topple centuries-old monarchies and forge new nation states. But when we look back at 1848 today, it seems less like the dawn of a new era and more like a missed opportunity because every single one of the revolutions of 1848 failed. And the counter-revolution went so far that in 1852, Marx commented that society seemed to have gone behind, um, but to retreated behind its starting point. Nevertheless, the revolutions of 1848 still hold a great significance. Not only did they draw the outlines of modern Europe, more important still, they laid the basis for the modern socialist revolution. Marx and Engels followed the events in 1848 very closely and even participated in them themselves. And the lessons they drew from their experience shaped their ideas and had a profound effect on the Marxism that we know and defend today. Sadly, with the time available, I won't be able to cover the events in detail, but I hope to draw out the fundamental processes at play and answer three main questions. One, why did revolution break out simultaneously in Europe in 1848? Two, why did those revolutions fail? And three, what lessons do the revolutions of 1848 hold for today? Now, to understand why revolution broke out all over Europe, it's necessary to take a look at European society up until 1848. And the first thing you would notice is how different the political landscape looked in the first half of the 19th century. First of all, Germany and Italy, two of the most important countries in modern Europe, didn't exist as nation states. Germany was made up of 39 different states, of which the most powerful were Prussia in the north and Austria in the south. As for Italy, the country was split between the Austrian Habsburg Empire, the Kingdom of Sardinia, the Papal States, and finally the Bourbon Kingdom of the Two Sicilies in the south. But not only were the borders of Europe very different to today, so were the political regimes. Absolutism remained the most common form of government. During the French Revolutionary Wars, many of these monarchies and empires of Europe had actually been overthrown and replaced by sister republics. But after the defeat of Napoleon in 1814-15, the victorious reactionary powers of Russia, Austria, Prussia and Britain set out not only to restore the old borders of Europe, but to restore the old monarchies as well. In France, the Bourbons returned to power, but the social basis of absolutism had been swept away by the revolution, and no force on earth could resurrect it. And the, the old Bourbon dynasty was swept away once again in a revolution in 1838. But this produced not a republic, but a new monarchy under the younger branch of the Bourbon dynasty, um, King Louis, Le, Louis Philippe. Now, the king granted his subjects a charter making some concessions, but crucially, he still picked the government. And the franchise was so restricted that even a section of the bourgeoisie didn't have the vote. And an even larger section of the bourgeoisie couldn't run for parliament. The freedom of the press and the right to assembly was very heavily restricted. And so what we see is everywhere on the continent, in order to guard against revolution and disorder, the existing states had attempted to fix social relations in place, effectively for all time. But here we have an interesting demonstration of historical materialism, because while the rulers of Europe were trying to fix Europe in place, economic development at the base of society was rendering that impossible. Europe in 1848 was still largely rural, and some, in some countries, traces of feudalism and even serfdom were still present. But capitalist industry was still beginning to develop, and it was increasingly coming into conflict with the semi-feudal political setup that had been rigidly maintained since 1814. Under pressure from more advanced countries like England, countries like Germany have slowly begun to industrialize, introducing things like steam power and railways. This is an example of what Trotsky would call combined and uneven development. And this development served to strengthen the bourgeoisie, which started to demand a greater share in the governing of the country. And it also laid down a material base for national unification by improving transport and communication. But perhaps even more development the beginnings of industrial development also created a young working class, which is also beginning to develop its own class outlook. Now, the large majority of the European working class at this time did not work in factories, and most workers were craftsmen of one form or another, working in small workshops of only a few people. In Germany, for example, many workers were still organized in guilds. Nevertheless, socialist ideas were beginning to circulate, especially in France, where they became very influential in the young workers' organizations. So what we can see from this brief survey is that European society was riven with contradictions on the eve of 1848. And the attempts of the rulers of Europe to consciously suppress those contradictions, which was designed to prevent another European-wide revolution, 
eventually turned into its opposite in conditions of deep economic and social crisis. Now, the prelude to the revolution begins with the potato famine in Ireland in 1846, which was followed by a poor grain harvest in 1847 and a sharp economic crisis caused by overproduction in Britain in particular. In some areas, grain prices doubled while wages stayed the same. Some of this will likely feel familiar today, where workers are facing a similar crisis. And it's in this context that it's worth mentioning something that Lenin pointed out. The revolutions actually tend to start at the top of society and not at the bottom. In Prussia, for example, the king desperately needed to raise taxes, but in order to do that, he needed to convene a diet or parliament. But when he did this, the lesser nobles and bourgeois representatives refused to vote for any taxes or loans unless he convened a regular parliament and granted a constitution. Meanwhile, in France, the liberal opposition wanted to introduce a modest extension of the franchise. And so they began a campaign of banquets, which were essentially political rallies, which called for reform. But as we often see in history, when these cracks at the top begin to emerge, that's when the masses begin to burst through. And in France, these banquets were rapidly taken over by Democrats and workers who started doing things like refusing to toast the king's health and crucially demanding universal suffrage. And from that point, the liberals already began to run from their own movement. On New Year's Day, 1848, the people of Milan began a boycott of tobacco and other products in order to deprive the Austrian Empire of its much needed tax income. That movement was brutally suppressed by the army, but this was only the beginning. On the 12th of July, the people of Palermo rose up in revolt, and the absolutist king of Sicily was so terrified he immediately agreed to grant a constitution. These were like the earthquakes that precede a Vesuvian eruption. And at the end of January, the liberal Alexis de Tocqueville stood up in the French parliament where he was a deputy and MP, and he gave a speech in which he said the following. This gentleman is my profound conviction. I believe that we are at this moment sleeping on a volcano. He later admitted he didn't know how right he was. The volcano erupted on the 22nd of February, only days after the publication of the Communist Manifesto. In fact, by the time the French translation arrived in Paris, the barricades were already being cleared away. Now, from the picture I've painted of Europe in 1848, it's quite clear that in all countries, the tasks of the coming revolution were bourgeois in character. By that, I mean they would promote the development of capital and the political rule of the bourgeoisie. Some of the conquests we would associate with the bourgeois revolution are things like national unification or independence, or the establishment of parliamentary constitutional rule, and the extension of democratic rights like the freedom of the press, by which they mean, of course, the freedom of the bourgeois press but also clearing away the last vestiges of pre-capitalist forms of land ownership and exploitation, such as serfdom, which is an essential precursor to the full development of capitalist industry. Nowhere in Europe had all of these tasks been achieved, except for Britain and arguably the Low Countries. Throughout the Austrian Empire, for example, peasants were still compelled to give a kind of labour rent called robot. I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. Even in France, where two bourgeois revolutions had already created a capitalist state, the industrial bourgeoisie was effectively excluded from power. That this was to be a bourgeois and therefore not a socialist revolution was also believed by Marx and Engels, especially in relation to Germany, where they believed the perspective was to help the bourgeoisie establish its own political rule in order, whilst while preparing to immediately fight against it once that rule had been secured. But as Trotsky would explain years later, the general sociological term bourgeois revolution by no means solves the politico-tactical problems contradictions and difficulties which the mechanics of a given bourgeois revolution throw up. And what would become clear in 1848 was that most of these revolutions were not carried out by the bourgeoisie at all. The February Revolution in France was carried out by the Parisian working class. And at every step, the liberal bourgeoisie tried to stop it, and even the radical republicans constantly tried to limit its demands. First, the liberals tried to cancel the last banquet, which was to be in Paris. But when they called it off, the workers just came out onto the streets anyway. When the authorities tried to clear the streets by force, the masses simply dispersed to all corners of the city and built over one and a half thousand barricades in the space of hours. The king tried to pacify them by firing his hated minister, Guizot, who gets a mention in the Communist Manifesto, but that only encouraged the workers, who then marched to Guizot's office carrying a massive red flag. When this demonstration reached a line of in infantry, Eventually, the troops opened fire and killed 52 people. The workers put the bodies of the killed on carts and carried them through the city all night with torches shouting vengeance 
By the next day, the whole city was completely under the control of the armed working class. At this point, the Liberals obtained an abdication from the king. They hoped to replace the king with his nine-year-old grandson. But when they went to announce the, the regency in Parliament, the workers just invaded the assembly, sat in the deputies' seats, very rudely, read out their own list of names for a provisional government, and then went to the Hotel de Ville, the city hall, to announce it to the people. In that moment, all of the power, all of the resources, all of the arms of the state meant nothing. But things went even further than that. Even the new provisional government didn't want to proclaim the republic. 30 minutes. While they were talking amongst themselves about what to do, some workers on a balcony behind them unfilled a massive red banner with the following um, written on it in charcoal. The republic, one and indivisible, is proclaimed. In other words, all of the factions of the bourgeoisie tried to prevent and hold back the revolution. And the republic was founded by the workers who at that point were the power in society. It was a bourgeois revolution carried out by the working class. An almost identical process took place in Russia in February 1917, even down to the abdication of the king, or Tsar. And as the news of the revolution in Paris spread across Europe, it sparked insurrections all over the continent. In Vienna, Berlin, not to mention other German cities, Milan, Venice, Naples, and later Rome. Everywhere the masses rose up, and the working class, even where it sm was small, played a leading role, while in most places the bourgeoisie gave up the fight from the very beginning. In Berlin, the king tried to actually get ahead of the revolution by offering concessions, like a regular parliament. And this satisfied the bourgeoisie, but not the masses who were encouraged to demand even more. As in Paris, the troops fired on the crowd, and the masses immediately built barricades throughout the city. And after a night of fierce fighting, in which it was the workers who gave their lives, the king removed the army from the city and effectively surrendered. Now, the working class in Germany was substantially weaker than in France, let alone England. But for an indication of the power of the workers, just in that moment, just listen to this. After the battle, a group of workers wanted to bring some of the, the killed, some of the dead, to the king so he could come out and see them and effectively apologize. So they brought over the bodies along with some demands and they demanded that he come out of his palace and see them. When they were told the king was in bed, they said, bring him out then. That doesn't usually happen. It reminds me of a scene in Pulp Fiction actually, but I won't go on. And out he came, he got out of bed and came out to see them and gave in to, in to all of their demands. And two days later, he was out marching through the streets wearing the black, red and gold of the flag of German unification. In Vienna, the workers' movement was arguably even less developed, and the workers effectively fought under the leadership of the radical students who formed the most radical democratic wing of the movement. But without the intervention of the working class, the victory of the revolution or temporary victory of the revolution would not have occurred. But in spite of all this, the people who were put in power by these revolutions were not the workers or their representatives. They were liberals or bourgeois republicans. Trotsky referred to this phenomenon in his History of the Russian Revolution as the paradox of February. He was referring, of course, to February 1917, but the same could be said of February 1848. The only exception to this is arguably Hungary, where the bourgeois and petty bourgeois nationalists took the lead from the beginning. And Lajos Kossuth, the main leader of the revolution, took great strides forward under the blows of the counter-revolution. He even declared independence and effectively turned the country into a republic in 1849. I should add that independence means independence from the Austrian Empire. <coughs> Engels compared him to Danton of the Great French Revolution, and he stands out in a European revolution that produced almost no notable leaders whatsoever. The reason for this is not just the role of the national question, which can give a, a temp temporary, shall we say, illusion of class unity, the Italian bourgeoisie, for example, did not play so progressive a role. The real reason for this exception actually lies with the workers, but in a negative form, because there was no real working class in Hungary at all at the time. It was a negligible factor, similar to in France in 18, sorry, 1789. What we see is when the bourgeoisie, or a section of it, feels itself at the head of the whole nation against either the foreign oppressor or the feudal aristocracy, it acts with confidence and it advances. The Hungarian nationalists felt this confidence because the rest of the Magyar population were almost all property owners, actually, of one degree or another, whether nobles, bourgeois, petty bourgeois, or peasant. The bourgeois really did stand at the head of the nation. By that, I mean specifically the Magyar population. The oppressed Slavic and Romanian peasants, who also lived in the Kingdom of Hungary, had less reason to support the revolution. And this ethnic division would provide a useful weapon in the hands of the Austrian emperor. Now, let's go back to France. Behind the, bourgeois, the French bourgeoisie in 1848 was not a grateful nation, 
but a class of propertyless workers who threaten to use any democratic gain to threaten bourgeois property. Accordingly, the entire bourgeoisie felt a hostage of its own revolution and played a reactionary role from the very beginning. Likewise, the German, Austrian, and Italian bourgeoisies saw in France a picture of their own future. So even though the working classes of their countries were much weaker, they deliberately curtailed their demands and betrayed their own revolution to absolutist reaction. They considered that a necessary, uh, a lesser evil compared to being left alone with their own workers. But this meant that everywhere the revolution started going into reverse as soon as the last barricades were cleared. The primary concern of the bourgeois leaders was to restore order as quickly as possible. And this meant disarming the workers and pacifying the masses one way or another. In Italy, the revolution in the north meant nothing other than war with Austria. And if the Austrians were beaten in Lombardy and Venetia, then the liberation of all Italy became a real prospect. And thousands of poor peasants flocked to the cities of Lombardy as soon as the revolution broke out. One Austrian officer in Milan described the peasants literally rolling down the hills, firing at the soldiers as they ran. No wonder the Austrians retreated. But rather than recruiting these peasants into a national army to pursue the retreating Austrians, the leaders turned them away. Now, on the face of it, this just doesn't make any sense to me. It only makes sense when you look at it from a class point of view. As the bourgeoisie saw it, because to arm, they saw that to poor, arm the poor masses was to threaten further revolution at home. Instead, they turned to the king of Sardinia, Charles Albert, himself an absolute monarch, to lead the fight against Austria with his army. Charles Albert accepted, perhaps because he feared what would happen if he didn't, to be honest, but he did nothing to build up his forces and spread the revolution which was the only guarantee of success. Giuseppe Garibaldi even offered to go up into the, the Italian lakes and fight a guerrilla war against the Austrians for him. And he was ignored. And without supplies and support, his, his attempts ultimately failed. <clears throat> Charles Albert, unsurprisingly, did not want to fight a revolutionary war. He hoped that French support and diplomatic inter uh, intervention would force some kind of agreement with Austria. In the end, the Austrian army was given time to regroup, plan a new offensive, and advanced so quickly, it took the Italians by surprise. And the Italian army was defeated at Custozza on this day, actually, the 25th of July, 1848. Now, this result was not predetermined. The Austrians actually lost more troops in that battle. And even after the defeat, the revolution could have advanced further and driven the Austrians out. But instead, Charles Albert fled back to Turin. And from this point, the Austrian Empire was effectively back in control in the north. Now, in Germany, after the revolution, universal suffrage, suffrage was formally recognized. But in practice, the application of the rules were left to the pre-existing German monarchies, which meant that everywhere the workers were excluded from the franchise. They were unable to vote for the so-called all-German assembly that they had themselves created, effectively. Yeah. And this betrayal was indicative of the whole short life of the Frankfurt Assembly, as it was called. It called itself a parliament for this new German nation, but it didn't have an armed force of its own at all. So every one of the decisions of this sovereign parliament depended on the consent of the pre-existing reactionary monarchs of Germany, especially Prussia. But in spite of these betrayals, the workers still initially greeted the gains of their revolutions with enthusiasm. But the workers didn't fight for democratic gains purely for their own sake. They saw them as a means to change their social conditions. And in all countries, the workers immediately started putting forward social class demands in Germany, there was a wave of strikes forcing bosses to raise wide wages and limit hours. Workers founded new organizations, new national trade union organizations, independent of the guilds, and sent thousands of petitions to the Frankfurt Assembly, which were almost entirely ignored, ignored of course. In France, the workers were so powerful in February that they could effectively impose their will on the government. Literally the day after the provisional government had been formed, a detachment of armed workers marched straight into the city hall where the government was based. Their leader banged the butt of his rifle on the floor and said three words, droit au travail, right to work. Now the right to work meant that the unemployed should be given useful work at decent wages and the state should organize production in order to ensure that that was achieved. It was in essence a demand for the state to start planning the economy and the government wrote and passed a decree on the spot with the workers watching over their shoulders, establishing national workshops to provide work for anybody who needed it. But this was still not a workers' government. And the moment the workers left the building, the provisional government began conspiring against them. The national workshops were not an embryo of the socialist planned economy. Marx described them as English workhouses in the open. Pointless work breaking rocks for a pittance. 
The workers quickly became disillusioned, and so they decided to turn to their own strength and started forming their own organizations for the seizure of power. They founded hundreds of revolutionary clubs and newspapers. And these clubs were basically workers' assemblies where every night people would come down and debate the issues of the day and even listen to lectures on science and economics, socialism. And these weren't small fringe clubs. One historian estimates that more than 100,000 workers were members of these clubs, subs paying members. Eventually, over 100 of these clubs united into a, a loose federation, which they imaginatively called the Club of Clubs. Instinctively, the workers were building their own independent revolutionary party. Marx described the clubs as the centers of the revolutionary proletariat, and he even called them the formation of a workers' state against the bourgeois state. Now, when you consider what would happen later in the Paris Commune of 1871, I consider those words written in 1850 to be extremely significant. And just as in Russia in the spring of 1917, a debate de started to develop within the club movement about what position they should take in relation to the provisional government. Should they support it? How critically should they support it? Should they overthrow it? 60 minutes. And almost all the club leaders decided to support it, albeit critically. But unfortunately, that su support was not reciprocated. After the elections in April, the Republican bourgeoisie emerged greatly strengthened and the workers were isolated. The masses in the towns and the countryside had elected people who seemed to support the republic. The distinction between a bourgeois republic and a workers' republic was obviously not clear at this point. And almost immediately after the results were known, a section of the, the most advanced section of the working class drew the conclusion that there needed to be a second revolution to overthrow this republic and install some form of workers' republic, although their idea of what that would look like was not clear. Even a revolutionary like Blanqui, who was in favor of overthrowing the government by the clubs, saw the second revolution more like the Jacobin revolution of uh, 1793. But meanwhile, the bourgeois republic moved onto the offensive. The government announced in June 1848 that the national workshops were to be closed and the workers were to be drafted into the army. The workers responded to this provocation with an insurrection which saw 50,000, at least 50,000 armed workers seize control of about half of the city. And these fighters undoubtedly had the support of many thousands more. It took four days of ferocious fighting in which artillery was used against workers' homes and thousands were killed to quell the revolt. In Engels' wor in Engels words, the workers fought with indescribable defiance of death, but crucially, they fought alone. The majority of the petty bourgeois in Paris, which was the majority of the population in the city, and the peasants in the countryside fought against the workers. The peasants volunteered to fight in the army against the workers. Later, uh, an important section of the petty bourgeoisie and peasants would actually move to the left in the direction of the working class. But by then it was too late. Marx and Engels immediately grasped the significance of the June days, as they were called. Marx called it the first decisive battle of the proletariat and the greatest revolution that has ever taken place, the revolution of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. But they also considered it they considered the defeat of the workers to be a fundamental turning point in the entire European revolution. If the workers had won, even temporarily, this would have weakened reaction everywhere and given a fresh impetus to the revolution across Europe. But defeat had the opposite effect. After June, the reaction regained its confidence. They saw it was possible to beat the workers after all. The Prussian state began to step up its repression in the summer, but the Frankfurt Assembly did nothing. From their disappointment, many workers drew the conclusions that they had to form their own national organizations to achieve their aims. The Austrian imperial court also moved onto the offensive. They sent the governor of Croatia, Jelicic, with an army to crush the Hungarian revolution. But when they attempted to send troops from Vienna, the students and workers were enraged. They rose up, murdered the minister of war, and seized control of the city. And the workers and students in Vienna had instinctively grasped the link between the revolution in Hungary and their own. This is something that Engels emphasized when he wrote, Germany will liberate herself to the extent to which she sets free neighboring nations. At all points, Marx and Engels considered each of the revolutions and national movements in 1848 in their relation to the European revolution as a whole. And they placed the working class at the forefront of that struggle. Marx wrote, the Hungarian shall not be free, nor the Pole, nor the Italian, so as long as the worker remains a slave. The Hungarians succeeded in pushing back Jelicic, and they could have pursued him all the way back to Vienna. But sadly, the military leaders did not want to overstep the bounds of legality by crossing over the border and, effect, and, and, and uh, attacking an emperor who had already attacked them. The Viennese were eventually slaughtered. And when the German workers saw their brothers in Vienna 
being crushed with no support from either Berlin or Frankfurt, they began to draw revolutionary conclusions. At a democratic congress in Berlin, they called not only for unification, but for a republic. Here we see how consciousness rapidly develops on the basis of experience. And no experience is more educational than a revolution. And it was this, with this in mind that Marx wrote that revolutions are the locomotives of history. In October, armed clashes took place between the workers and the National Guard militia in Berlin. And in November, King Frederick William II of Prussia carried out a coup. He dispersed the Prussian Constituent Assembly that he would, had granted during the revolution and imposed martial law on Berlin for six months. All over Europe, the workers have been defeated. Their forces were small, their organizations were only just coming into being, and they were learning lessons for the very first time. But if the workers could not have saved the revolution, could any other class in society? After all, hadn't the most radical phase of the Great, Revolu Great French Revolution been led by the radical petty bourgeoisie in the form of the sans-culotte? But unfortunately, the experience of 1848 and 49 demonstrated that the entry of the working class onto the stage of history had infected the radicals with the same disease as the liberals. In France, where the workers were strongest, the so-called radical petty bourgeoisie supported every attack on the workers. Not a single member of parliament supported the workers in June, for example. Not even the socialist deputies. Not even Proudhon, the anarchist, so-called anarchist. These radicals saw themselves above all as above the class struggle. And what they defended was an abstract republic, which was supposed to meet the needs of all classes. So when the workers threatened this republic, which in reality was a bourgeois republic, even the most radical Democrats sided with the state, as they always do. But having helped to pacify, demoralize, and disarm the working class, the French Democrats later tried to save their republic by calling their own insurrection on the 13th of June, 1849. A new June day, as you might think. But unlike the workers in June 1848, they called it with no preparation, no weapons, and no slogans except for long live the constitution. The workers' insurrection lasted four days. The insurrection of the radical petty bourgeoisie lasted four minutes. But an almost identical and arguably even more pathetic process took place in Germany. Having hitched itself to the Prussian monarchy, the Democrats, the Democrats in the Frankfurt Assembly were shocked when the king refused to ratify the constitution they'd written for him. And in May, the conflict between the old, real states and this new, fictitious assembly broke out into inevitable civil war. The conservative deputies all left the assembly, so that put the, this parliament entirely in the hands of the radical Democrats. And in many parts of Germany, workers, artisans, peasants actually rose up and took up arms to defend the assembly and the constitution. Engels went over and fought himself. But each local rising was left on its own to be mopped up by the forces, you know, the well-trained armies of the monarchies. And faced by, with a choice between submitting and fighting, the assembly chose to do neither, which was the worst option of all. Engels accused them of cowardly imbecility. And on the basis of this experience, Marx and Engels concluded that the petty bourgeoisie was the class the least capable of carrying out even the most basic democratic tasks of the revolution. By the autumn of 1849, almost all of the gains of the revolutions of 1848 had been lost. Even in France, which had overthrown the old regime, first universal suffrage and then the republic itself was abolished in the years to come. Only the abolition of labor rent in, Aust in the Austrian Empire and the abolition of slavery in the French colonies were retained. Even the most ferocious counter-revolution couldn't bring back those dead, defunct relations. Trotsky described the revolutions of 1848 as both too early and too late. Too late for the bourgeoisie to play a progressive role, but too early for the truly progressive class, the workers, to seize power. Marx said the social revolution had been decreed but not realized. The revolution also came too early for Marx and the Communist League, which was too small to make an impact on events. As Engels puts it, it was necessary to begin again. Marx himself was expelled from Paris, where he was living in August uh, 1849, and he moved to London as a refugee with his wife and children. There they lived in such poverty that when one of their young children died, they couldn't even afford a coffin. I think we sometimes forget it takes a lot to begin again, but begin he did, and he began with ideas. From the defeat of 1848, Marx drew a number of very important conclusions for the future of the revolutionary movement. And he set these out in an address to the Communist League in 1850, which I would rec highly recommend that comrades read in full. And I'll, I'll list, in my opinion, the most important here. Number one, the liberal bourgeoisie will not carry out any of the tasks of the bourgeois revolution. Two, a future revolution will bring the petty bourgeoisie democracy to power first. Three, the workers would have to fight alongside the petty bourgeoisie democracy against their mutual enemies, but must not prop up or participate in the government. Instead, the workers must retain their arms 
and I quote, simultaneously establish their own revolutionary workers' government, either in the form of local executive committees and councils or through workers' clubs or committees. The formation and independence of the proletarian party must be achieved at all costs, and that the consolidation of the bourgeois regime must be prevented and the revolutionary turmoil uh, prolonged until the workers are able to overthrow the government and install their own, which Marx called the dictatorship of the proletariat. Finally, he added that the revolution cannot succeed within the, within the borders of any single nation. It must spread to the rest of Europe and to England in particular as the most advanced capitalist country. He concluded the workers' battle cry must be the permanent revolution. In this, he had discovered the logic, the dialectic of the modern revolution. His genius lay in, lay in the fact that he discovered it before it could actually be realized. But it would have enormous significance for the revolutions of the 20th century and still has today. It was precisely this logic that Trotsky, Leon Trotsky applied to the Russian Revolution of 1905. And it was this program, almost to the letter, I would say, that uh, the Bolsheviks took up from April 1917 under Lenin's leadership. And it was that that brought the workers to power in 1917. So I think it's fair to say that without the tragedy of 1848, there might not have been the triumph of 1917. But both Lenin and Trotsky also warned that if the socialist revolution did not spread elsewhere to Europe in the more developed capitalist countries, it would fail. It would go down to defeat. But all of these lessons were abandoned by the Stalinist leadership of the Comintern in the 1920s. But I don't have time to go into that now, unfortunately. Today, the volcano of revolution is ready to rot again. But today, the working class has never been stronger, and the worldwide socialist revolution has never been more achievable. The fate of the world rests on the shoulders of the working class and its leadership. But if it is to conquer power, it needs a worldwide revolutionary party of the proletariat. Comrades, let us take up the task of building that party and carry out the revolution decreed by the heroic workers of 1848. Thank you. Well, thank you for that fantastic presentation, Josh. So yeah, we will have uh, time for one speaker before we take a break, uh, and that will be Rob Sewell from the British section. Well, comrades, I think that uh, Josh has done uh, a magnificent job in outlining the events in 1848 and the lessons from it. And I was going to concentrate on why there wasn't a revolution in Britain, which is linked to the rise and fall of, of Chartism. But, uh, but I won't do that. Instead, I'll recommend uh, a book by an upcoming young author, which deals with this uh, question. Here it is, The Chartist Revolution, which explains the reason for that uh, abnormality. Instead, I'd like to concentrate on some of the remarks about Marx's lessons from the revolution. As Josh explained, uh, in 1850, Marx uh, and Engels wrote an important, a very important document called the Address of the Central Committee to the Communist League. And uh, I agree with Josh that uh, you should read this for yourself because it is full of important lessons for today. Uh, both Marx and Engels were leading members of the Communist League who participated fully in the 1848 revolution. And while the famous Communist Manifesto outlined the fundamentals of scientific socialism, this new document, this address to the Communist League, written after the great upheavals in Europe, provided a political balance sheet of the events from the viewpoint of the working class. And although it is less known, this, this address, from the point of view of tactics and strategy of the socialist revolution, provides both historical and theoretical lessons of equal importance. As Josh quoted Marx, that revolutions are the locomotives of history. And at the beginning of 1848, both Marx and Engels recognized that the main struggle was against absolutism. And they expected that the German uh, uh, rising capitalist class would take the initiative in this bourgeois revolution. Now, in the Communist Manifesto, they, they, they wrote the following that the communists would never cease for a single moment to instill the working class with the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonisms between the bourgeoisie and proletariat. But at the same time, he said, that uh, mobilizing the workers to fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy and feudal squirearchy, they would, they would support the bourgeois in that struggle. But of course, in the... While the events took place, it became clear that the bourgeoisie were terrified of the workers' movement. And this pu pushed the bourgeoisie in the direction of counter-revolution. In particular, the June days in Paris 
which for the first time in history raised the specter of proletarian revolution, drove all the exploited classes in Germany over to the side of reaction. The various democratic assemblies which were established in Germany at the beginning of the, of the uh, victory were ignominiously abandoned by the liberal bourgeoisie and the remaining forces of the revolution were quickly routed by the reaction. And from this very experience, Marx and Engels drew new theoretical and tactical conclusions. They'd always believed or envisaged that the German, that in Germany, the proletarian revolution would follow very quickly on the bourgeois revolution. But now it was clear that the bourgeoisie were playing a counter-revolutionary role and couldn't destroy feudalism and, ab and absolutism. And therefore this task, this revolutionary task fell to the working class and its allies to carry out. And therefore, Marx concluded that the bourgeois revolution would now merge into the first stages of the socialist revolution. Thus, in this uh, address to the Communist League, Marx and Engels first formulated the revolutionary idea of permanent revolution out of the experiences of 1848-49. And why they fully expected the petty bourgeois democrats to take the initiative in the next revolution, Marx and Engels laid heavy stress that the working class needed to provide its own independent leadership and to ten, ten minutes. advance its own class demands in this revolution. So they thought that the socialist revolution was imminent in Germany at that time. Unfortunately, they were proved wrong. And with the benefit of hindsight, Engels wrote in 1895, history has proved us wrong. It has, it has made it clear that the state of economic development on the continent at that time was not right for the elimination of capitalist production. In the year 1848, therefore, it still had great capacity to expand. But this mistake was not one of fact or rather it was one of fact, not of method of Marxism. In fact, this mistake about tempo does not in the least detract from the validity of the strategy and tactics laid down. And as Josh explained, that the ideas contained in this address were a brilliant anticipation of the policies adopted by Lenin and the Bolsheviks. It is clear that the ideas of this address were the theoretical basis of Leon Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution. It is noticeable today, however, that the ideas of the address, with its insistence on a careful class analysis of every situation, and its call for complete and political and organizational independence of the working class, and its stress on the need of the working class energetically to fight for its own aims and interests, provides a devastating criticism of Stalinism and reformism, which is based on the ideas of class collaboration and the theory of stages, which have been a disaster over the last hundred years. In summing up, I would say that our examination of 1848 events is not a dry academic exercise, but on the contrary, is an important vital contribution to tactics of strategy. And those tactics and strategy that we need to be armed today for the very struggles that are opening up. So this is not just this is not dry theory. This is the reality of the class struggle today. The next speaker we have is Jacopo, who will be speaking in Spanish. La revolución de 1848 tiene ciertas peculiaridades. The revolution of 1848 in Italy has certain peculiarities. Ella sin duda ha de reunir el proceso revolucionario in the process of revolution, the question of national and the question of social. Amongst those, without doubt, the question of uniting, um, bringing together in the revolutionary process, the national question and the social question. The peninsula Italiana was divided into eight states, formally independent, but under the hegemony of the great powers. In these years, the Italian peninsula was divided into eight states that were formally independent, but came under the hegemony of the great powers of Europe. One of those was the state of the church, which was governed by the Pope, who was the spiritual leader and also the king. The development of Italian capitalism had only just begun. But even in Italy, we could see the first uh, movements of the working class in the, in the five days of Milan uh, in March of 1848. Una insurrección 
por la que la ciudad fue temporalmente liberada de los ocupantes austríacos. Which was uh, an insurrection in which the city was temporarily liberated uh, from the Austrians. Lamentablemente, no tengo tiempo para profundizar todos los acontecimientos del 48 italiano. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail about the events of the 48 Italian. Y me centraré en lo que considero el punto más alto de este proceso, es decir, la República Romana del 1849. And I'm going to focus on what I consider to be the high point of this process, that's to say, the Roman Republic of 1849. La historia del papado ha vivido grandes y extraordinarios acontecimientos. The history of the papacy has lived through great and extraordinary events. Pero solo en el 1849, el papa escapó de Roma por el miedo de un levantamiento popular. But in uh, 1849, the pope escapes from Rome from fear of a popular uprising. Pío IX había sido elegido papa sucediendo a un papa reaccionario que había reprimido severamente todas las tendencias liberales y democráticas. Pius IX had been elected a pope in June of 1846, uh, succeeding a reactionary pope who had severely repressed all of the liberal and democratic tendencies and governed with a sword. With a sword. La elección del nuevo papa fue recibida con el favor popular, incrementado por una serie de reformas que se concedieron. The election of a new pope was received with great popular uh, support, which increased with, through a series, thanks to a series of reforms that he conceded. Entre ellas, la amnistía, una mayor libertad de prensa y un estatuto que concedía mayores libertades democráticas. Amongst those, amnesty, um, more freedom of the press, and a bit later in month, in the month of March, a statute that conceded. Uh, great uh, major democratic freedoms. Como dijo Engels, el hombre que ocupa la posición más reaccionaria de toda Europa, que representa la ideología fossilizada de la Edad Media, el Papa se ha colocado a la cabeza de un movimiento liberal. As Engels said, the man who occupies the most reactionary position in all of Europe and represents a fossilized ideology of the Middle Ages, the Pope, has placed himself at the head of the liberal movement. Las reformas beneficiaron principalmente a la burguesía, que ganó más influencia en la opinión pública, mientras que el papel de la... These reforms benefited mainly the bourgeoisie, which gained more influence in public administration, whilst uh, the role of the nobility re uh, reduced, was reduced. El Papa liberal aumentó las ilusiones tanto en las filas de la burguesía Cuanto los sectores populares. The liberal pope uh, raised the illusions uh, amongst the layers of the bourgeoisie as well as layers of the popular classes. Uh, to the point where Mazzini is, wrote him a, a letter asking him to direct the process towards national unity and Garibaldi himself declared himself uh, free or available to uh, to work for him. But the condition of the masses was of growing poverty. And this increased uh, the hatred of the classes, the popular classes towards the nobles and towards the prelates and the par parasitic uh, sectors of society. Pero ante el crecimiento del movimiento democrático, Pío IX dio pasos atrás, abandonando la causa nacional y abriendo una fase de crisis política. But ahead of the growth of the um, democratic movement, Pius IX took a few steps back, abandoning the national cause and opening a phase of a political crisis. El 24 de noviembre, aterrorizado por la movilización popular, huye de Roma y se refugia en el reino de las dos Sicilias bajo la protección de los Borbones. The 24th of November, terrorized by the popular mobilization, he fled Rome and uh, so, sought refuge in the kingdom of the two Sicilias, of the two Sicilies, sorry, under the protection of the Borbones. De febrero se proclama la República Romana. The 9th of February, they declared the Republic of Rome. The Republic uh, established the Constituent Assembly with universal uh, male suffrage, um, and the participation was very high. La vida política cobra vida con mítines y manifestaciones. Political uh, life gained uh, gained life with um, rallies and protests. 
An authentic explosion of, part of political participation that was typical in, as it is typical in all revolutions. Pero algunas reformas explican el carácter progresivo de esta experiencia. But some of the reforms uh, explain the progressive character of this experience. La expropiación de los bienes de la iglesia, el préstamo forzoso impuesto a familias ricas, a las empresas comerciales y a las clases terratenientes. The expropiation of the possessions of the church, the uh, forced in, imposition of loans uh, from rich families and uh, commercial businesses, uh, and also to land the landowning class. La abolición de la Inquisición y las tierras de las iglesias que se distribuyeron a las familias campesinas. The abolition of the Inquisition and the distribution of the church lands to the peasants. Se instituyeron las peticiones del pueblo para exponer las quejas y los agravios directamente a la Asamblea. They established a system of uh, people's petitions in order to expose uh, complaints um, directly to uh, brought in front of the assembly. Pero la respuesta de la reacción no se ha hecho esperar. But the response from the action um, from reaction did not wait. Además de la excomunión del Papa, se formó una santa alianza para restaurar con cañones el orden papal, papal y nobiliario. As well as the excommunication of the Pope, they formed a, a sacred alliance to restore the uh, canons of the papal order and nobility. Francia, Austria, España y los Borbones se unieron para aplastar los insurgentes. France, Austria, Spain and the Bourbons united forces to crush the insurgents. Pero también los revolucionarios llegaron en defensa de la república desde todo el mundo. But the revolutionaries came to the defense of, of the republic from all over the world. Los días del asedio francés, la ciudad caracteriza, se caracterizó no solo por el heroísmo de los combatientes, sino también por una importante participación popular. The days of the French siege of the city characterized not only by the heroism of the combatants against reaction, but also an important uh, popular participation. Aparecieron por primera vez las banderas rojas que se izaron en las barricadas. For the first time, the red flags appeared on, on the barricades. Pero en los cinco meses de la vida de la República también surgirán todas las tendencias políticas y todas las limitaciones que llevarán a la inevitable derrota. But also in the five months of the life of the Roman Republic, there also we also saw rising up all el political liderazgo. tendencies and all the limitations uh, that would lead to an inevitable defeat. El liderazgo de Mazzini estaba uh, impregna impregnado de teorías interclasistas. The leadership of Mazzini was uh, impregnated with interclassist uh, theories. Su teoría era una teoría democrático burgués, según la cual la democracia burguesa ofrecía derechos políticos a los trabajadores para preservar los privilegios sociales de las clases medias y altas. His theory was bourgeois democratic in nature, according to which the bourgeois demo democracy offers political rights to workers in order to preserve the social privileges of the middle and upper classes. El mismo Garibaldi estaba dispuesto a compromisos con la monarquía conservadora piemontesa. Uh, the same, uh, self same Garibaldi was prepared to provide uh, support to the conservative monarchy of Piemontesa. Mientras las corrientes socialistas estaban todavía débiles. Whilst the socialist trends, currents, were still weak. Pero la fuerza de la reacción tenía más claro que nadie el riesgo que corrían. But the forces of reaction were, had it clearer than anyone else the risks that they were running. No es casualidad que Pio IX promulgara una encíclica contra los peligros del comunismo y del socialismo. It's not an uh, accident that Pius IX declared an encyclical against the dangers of the ideas of communism and socialism. La República es un ejemplo de cómo la dirección burguesa de Mazzini fue incapaz de llevar adelante el proceso de la unidad nacional sobre una base revolucionaria. Uh, the Republic is an example of how the bourgeois leadership of Mazzini was incapable of carrying forward the process of national unity on a revolutionary basis. Pero de las cenizas de esta experiencia tomaron formas la, uh, las primeras corrientes socialistas en Italia. But from the ashes of this experience, we can take the first, uh, we can see the first Italian socialist uh, tendencies. En primer lugar, 
Carlo Pisacane, que llegó a las ideas de la lucha de clases después de esta experiencia. And the first of those being Carlo Pisacane, who through the uh, experience of this class struggle uh, arrived at the uh, socialist ideas. El recuerdo de estos acontecimientos revolucionarios revivirá en las luchas futuras. And the memory of these revolutionary events would continue on in the future struggles and the memories of the revolutionaries. Como dice una canción, uh, como dice una canción comunista romana, as a communist, a Roman communist song says, Cuando arceremos sobre el Quirinale, bandera rosa. Cuando levantaremos la bandera roja sobre el Quirinal. Uh, as uh, the Roman communist song says, when we raise the red flag above the Quirinal. So the next speaker we have is uh, Rob Lyon. <clears throat> Marx and Trotsky both commented on the in insignificant scope of the 1848 revolutions. And at first glance, this might seem, seem a bit strange because uh, the 1848 revolutions remain the most widespread revolutionary wave in European history. And as Marxists, we often speak of the historic significance of the French and Russian revolutions. And this is because in those revolutions, a new dominant class emerged, the old order was smashed, and a new society was proclaimed. But this was not the case in 1848. In every country where a revolution erupted, these revolutions were defeated and the old order was saved. And in the French Revolution of 1789, capitalist society was still emerging. The class relations of capitalism were just beginning to coalesce. And in 1789, the French bourgeoisie could stand at the head of the nation and proclaim to the other classes, we will liberate you from feudalism. And, and this was more or less the truth. The, the other classes, especially the working class, which was more of a, a, a proto-working class, were, were not yet ready to counterpose their own class interests to those of the bourgeoisie. As Marx said, the, uh, the proletariat and the non-bourgeois strata of the middle class had either not yet evolved interests which were different from those of the bourgeoisie, or they did not yet constitute independent classes or class divisions. Therefore, where they opposed the bourgeoisie, as they did in France in 1793 and 1794, they fought only for the attainment of the aims of the bourgeoisie, although in a non-bourgeois manner. But by 1948, the situation was quite different. Capitalism and its class relations were developing everywhere. The working class was growing, beginning to organize and to form trade unions, especially. It was transforming from a class in itself to a, into a class for itself. And in Europe, the bourgeoisie was becoming the dominant class economically. But everywhere it was running into the roadblocks of the old feudal aristocracy who largely maintained political power. The capitalist economic base of European society was colliding with the old semi-feudal political superstructure. And when the revolutions of 1848 broke out, the bourgeoisie saw an opportunity to wage a struggle against these feudal restraints. But with the outbreak of revolution, what happened? The bourgeoisie saw that it could no longer stand at the head of the nation. The other classes did not fall in line behind the bourgeoisie and support it, as they had done in, in 1789. And in 1848, the working class began to counterpose its own interests against, against those of the capitalists. But the proletariat was too young and inexperienced. It, it lacked its own revolutionary organiza organizations that could achieve its objective political interests. And so the working class could not yet stand as, as the head of the nation. Neither the bourgeoisie or the working class could play this role. Th this is why the bourgeoisie recoiled in horror at the 1848 revolutions. The masses didn't support them, but opposed them. The bourgeoisie's private ownership of the means of production was under threat. So the bourgeoisie turned its back on the revolution and joined the counter-revolution. It sought compromise with the old feudal forces of the past. And the bourgeois did not seek political rule, but only to share political rule with the forces of feudal reaction. From the perspective of the bourgeoisie, this was the main achievement of the 1848 revolutions. But the growth of production in capitalist markets revolted against the parochial feudal political structure. Capitalism needed national markets politically embodied in bourgeois nation states. And this main task of capitalism remained unachieved across much of Europe. Had the revolutions of 1848 been successful, it would have been possible to solve this national problem by democratic means. In Germany, the solution of, of the national question really required one thing, which was unification. And after the defeat of the revolution of 1848, Germany remained divided into a series of small states and principalities. And this was a major obstacle for the free development of capitalism in Germany and therefore of, of the working class. Unification was therefore a progressive demand, but the question of who would unite Germany and by what means was of central importance. Marx hoped that the task of unification would be achieved uh, from below by the working class using revolutionary means, but, but, but this was not to be. And so since the proletariat had failed to solve this question by revolutionary means in 1848, 
It was solved by reactionary means by the feudal Prussian, uh, Prussian Junkers under Bismarck. G Germany was united through a series of wars, war with the Danish, war with Austria. But German unification was in and of itself progressive, but it was achieved through these reactionary means. Unification allowed for the rapid development of capitalism in Germany. In fact, this was the basis for an economic boom in Europe in the 1860s and, and uh, 1870s and the rapid development of capitalism across Europe. The problem of national unification was largely resolved on this basis in Germany and Italy, but it also allowed for the unity and development of the working class. And this becomes clear with the Paris Commune. 20 some years after 1848, the working class had developed enormously. And in the Paris Commune, the working class was able not only to counterpose its interests to those of the bourgeoisie clearly, it was able to overthrow the bourgeoisie. In 1848, the working class was young and inexperienced in politics and revolution, but it had gained experience and learned. But the, but the Paris Commune also suffered a defeat, the counter-revolution overthrew it. And, and this taught the working class one more lesson. In order to succeed in revolution, in order to conquer power and hold it, the working class needs a revolutionary party. And this lesson was again learned in 1905 in Russia. Russia in 1905 was in many respects similar to European countries in 14, uh, 1848. Capitalism was developing and growing under the political dominance of the aristocracy and feudalism. But as Trotsky said, the 19th century had not passed in vain. World capitalism had changed. The proletariat, through its revolutionary leadership, had learned these, these lessons of history. The working class fought with a new weapon, the Soviets, the instrument of workers' democracy. And these historic lessons learned by the proletariat were put into practice in 1917 where with a revolutionary party at its head, the working class succeeded in conquering power in the Russian Revolution. Today, many of these lessons have been lost or forgotten, but the revolutionary wing of the working class, the, the Marxists, we remember these lessons. Our task is, is, uh, is now to retie the knot of history and to help the working class relearn these lessons and fight for the long overdue world socialist revolution. Uh, the next speaker we have is Gernot. Hey comrades, after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, the Austrian Empire was the main reactionary power in Europe. The conservative statesman, Prinz Metternich, who is mentioned in the first paragraph of the Communist Manifesto, the one with the specter, had established a kind of police and military dictatorship to prevent any opposition against the existing order. Being afraid of revolutionary upheaval for many years, the Habsburg government did not allow the setting up of factories in Vienna, the capital of the empire. But sooner or later, the capitalist development could not be stopped anymore from above. Friedrich Engels wrote in 1847, taking up a quote by the former emperor, the Austrian empire could withstand the revolutions in France, but it will not withstand the steam engine. In the same year, the Austrian economy was hit by a severe economic crisis. Most factories closed and workers got unemployed and had to starve. At the beginning of 1848, there was literally no bread anymore in the suburbs of Vienna. On March 13th, following the example of revolution in France, also Vienna rose against the monarchy. Students and bourgeois Democrats called for an end to censorship, demanded a constitution, and organized in an armed national guard based on property and education, which meant excluding the workers. But when the news spread to the working class suburbs, a new element emerged in this revolution. Spontaneously, the workers linked the democratic struggle with their own class demands. The mass of unemployed workers started to burn the hated tax collecting offices and the march to the factories and started to destroy the new machinery. So there was a ring of flames around Vienna. And this was the moment when Metternich had to resign and to leave the country. And the emperor conceded the right to free speech, free press, and he promised a constitution, including a democratically elected parliament. So it was the working class protest which gave a first victory to the bourgeois revolution. But in the same night, on the first day of the Viennese revolution, the bourgeois national guard marched to the suburbs and smashed the workers' uprising. Around 60 people were killed in this night, most of them male and female workers from the suburbs. The funeral became a mass demonstration of workers and bourgeois for the revolution. It was, by the way, the first time that in the city of counter-reformation and anti-Semitism, Catholics, Protestants and Jews came together for a joint funeral celebration. The funeral was also a show of unity of the revolutionary movement in Vienna with the struggle for independence in Italy and Hungary. But the banners of, bourgeois, of the bourgeois at this funeral were very clear warning to the workers. They called, for example, for constitution, freedom, law and order, 
or martial law against robbery and arson. And the government proposed a new constitution which would have denied the right to vote to the mass of the population, the revolution erupted once again. This so-called night of the barricades led to a situation of dual power in Vienna. And from now on, the revolutionary movement split openly into two camps, the bourgeois forces who feared further turmoil and on, and on the other side, the students and the workers. From then on, there was a process of militant class struggle where all sectors of the working class, printers, railway workers, construction workers, demanded higher wages and better conditions. Under these conditions, the bulk of bourgeois called for law and order and the end to revolution. And it was the Minister of Labor, a liberal, who launched the offensive against the workers. He ordered to cut the wages for female workers and thought he could, and thought he could split the movement. But the female workers responded with a spontaneous strike movement, which got the immediate support of their male workmates. But again, many workers were killed in this event by the bourgeois National Guard. In the days after this so-called Prater battle, Karl Marx came to Vienna to have discussions with the most radical elements of the democratic and proletarian organizations. From his point of view, Vienna was the key to a successful revolution in all over Germany. But he warned that the revolution is facing defeat because of the mistrust and open betrayal of the bourgeoisie against the working class. In Vienna, Karl Marx did not only speak on theory, but intervened, intervened in the movement, laying the first foundations of a revolutionary program and method within the Austrian labor movement. From now on, the counter-revolution tried to smash the revolution in Vienna. And in October, the decisive battle started. The emperor and the court left Vienna, followed not only by the aristocrats, but also by the majority of bourgeois politicians, and in this situation, the revolutionary forces were reduced to the left of the democratic movement, the students and the workers. The workers refused to print reactionary papers, built barricades and finally armed themselves to defend the city. After days of heavy fighting, the counter-revolution took Vienna and smashed the revolution with brutal force. For nearly 20 years, the Viennese workers' movement was dead. But the tradition of 1848 lived on and became an important point of reference for the labor movement at the end of the 19th century and is still part of our revolutionary heritage. Uh, yeah, so the final uh, intervener we have before we uh, pass it back to Josh is uh, Jorge Martin. I thought that Josh's uh, introduction was excellent and did a very good job in covering a very uh, broad subject. I just wanted to add a few comments on the question of tactics. First, just to say that, of course, uh, the Communist League, to which Marx and Engels belong, had only been established recently. And that the Communist Manifesto, uh, the, the, the ink was, wasn't even dry on it when the revolution started. And what does the Communist Manifesto say about Germany and the tactics of the communists? It says, in Germany, it fights the Communist Party with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way. But the experience was to prove that uh, not even in Germany, the bourgeoisie did not act in a revolutionary way. When Marx moved to Cologne, the local branch of the Communist League was dominated by extremely confused elements, which toyed with anti-political uh, ideas. And, and, so, uh, and so Marx couldn't work through that organization even though he had the authority of the Central Committee of the, of the League. Uh, and, and therefore, he threw himself into the work of the, of the, of the newspaper that he created, which you will, you will forgive me for trying to uh, pronounce it in German, the, the Neue Rhenanische Zeitung, which described itself as the organ of democracy. So clearly, Marx acted in the revolution as the extreme left wing of the Democratic Party. And so what was the relationship between uh, the workers' movement that Marx wanted to represent, i.e. the communists, and the petty bourgeois democrats once the bourgeois had completely betrayed? In the address of the Central Committee to the Communist League in, in 1850, which Josh has uh, mentioned, uh, Mar Marx says the following. The relationship of the Revolutionary Workers' Party to the petty bourgeois democrats is this. It cooperates with them against the party which they aim to overthrow. It opposes them wherever they wish to secure their own position. And this had been really the position of Marx throughout the, the events. That is to support the petty bourgeois Democrats 
in as much as they took any positive steps forward, a united front against reaction, but at the same time maintaining political independence of the working class and insisting in mistrust towards the bur petty bourgeois Democrats, which he said, the democratic petty bourgeois want to bring the revolution to an end as quickly as possible. And as had been proven throughout, the, petty bourgeois, the main characteristic of the petty bourgeois in the revolution was the hesitation. And the fact that they were infatuated with constitutional phrase mongering rather than active, real action. And, and the address, the, the, this text says the following. In the coming struggle also, the petty bourgeois to a man will hesitate as long as possible and remain fearful, irre irresolute and inactive. But when victory is certain, it will claim it for itself and will call upon the workers to behave in an orderly fashion, to return to work and to prevent so-called excesses. Uh, the last time I was, when I was reading this, um, uh, the writings of Marx and Engels uh, about the 1848 revolution, this was immediately after the Catalan referendum of 2017. And in reality, the criticism that Marx and Engels makes of the petty bourgeois Democrats in 1848 applies completely to the position of the petty bourgeois Democrats that led the Catalan movement in 2017, down to the details. And what does Marx advise the workers to do in relation to this hesitancy and, and, uh, and treacherous role of the petty bourgeois? And, uh, and he says, the workers must check in every way and as far as it, as it is possible, the victory, euphoria and enthusiasm for the new situation, which follows every successful street battle. And they must keep a cool and cold-blooded analysis of the situation with an undisguised mistrust of the new government. I would say that these lines apply to any of the revolutionary movements that we have seen in the last, uh, in the recent period, where the masses have overthrown the old regime, for instance, in Sudan, in Egypt, in Tunisia, but only for the petty bourgeois uh, to take over. What needs to be done, uh, asks Marx. And this, this program, which he now describes, uh, which I will quote, is applies uh, uh, word by word to the situation in these countries. Alongside the new official governments, they must simultaneously establish their own revolutionary workers' governments, either in the form of local executive committees and councils or through workers' clubs and committees so that the bourgeois democratic governments not only immediately lose the support of the workers, but find themselves from the very beginning supervised and threatened by authorities behind which stand the whole mass of the workers. From the very moment of victory, the workers' suspicion must be directed no longer against the defeated reactionary party, but against the former ally. And as I said, this, these words uh, apply to 1848, that uh, Marx here was talking about perspectives for, for the new revolution, but apply uh, perfectly well to revolutions and revolutionary movements that have taken place in the last few years. And the whole experience of the 1848 revolutions uh, uh, pushed Marx, Marx to, to draw this, this main conclusion. The need for political independence of the working class, to combat any illusions in the role of the petty bourgeois Democrats, to organize the workers along their own uh, separate uh, lines, even within the common uh, movement. Finally, after the, after, the move, after the peak of the movement had passed, Marx and Engels still formed for a very short period of time a joint organization, a joint communist organization with uh, Blanqui, but immediately broke with him. Because as Rob uh, explained in his contribution, Marx and Engels understood that uh, in order for a new movement of the workers to develop, that, that would only come after the period of economic growth that had already started had come to an end. That is, the change in uh, objective conditions would provoke a new revolutionary wave, as opposed to the idea of Blanqui that the will of the revolutionaries could create artificially out of, regardless of the conditions, a new revolution. And by the time a new movement was to start, uh, Marx and Engels had already uh, advanced the work of the creation of the International Workers' Association, International Working Men's Association. And that is, that is it for the interventions we have. Uh, and I will turn it back to Josh uh, to sum up. Okay, thank you very much, Joel. 
And thank you for all the comrades who came into the discussion. I think it's been an excellent discussion. I found Geordie's intervention um, extremely interesting. I'm pleased that he, he, he was able to flesh out these very important tactical points about the relationship between the working class and the petty bourgeoisie, which is still a live issue today. And a point I wanted to add on onto that, which I didn't have time to in the lead off, relates to what Marx had to say about what he called social democracy. In France, after the, the June defeat, the remaining workers' clubs and socialist societies entered into an alliance with the radical democratic faction in parliament called the Mountain. Um, this effectively formed a, a mass parliamentary party of the working class in France at that time. And it called itself Social Democratic or Democratic Socialist. At its high point in 1849, it not only had the support of the working class, it also won um, a, a, a large minority of votes from the peasantry and even votes from soldiers in the army. But it remi remained at all times completely under the leadership of the radical petty bourgeoisie. And I already talked about where that led to in June 1849. But again, in 1851, the Social Democrats still had mass support. Louis Bonaparte at that time had made it pretty clear he was going to launch a coup in order to cut across the threat of communism, as he put it. And the Social Democratic leaders spent the year preaching calm to the masses and telling them to look forward to the day when they can march into the ballot boxes and vote Louis Bonaparte out. Unfortunately, Bonaparte and the French ruling class had seen that one coming, and so he threw them all in jail. And from this, Marx managed to get to the heart of reformism, of social democratic politics, as early as 1852, after basically the first ever experiment. He said that the peculiar nature of social democracy is that the socialist class demand, that the socialist point is broken off the demands of the working class and adapted to bourgeois democracy. Effectively, the workers' demands are bent and adapted to the class outlook of the petty bourgeoisie. And he added in his address in 1850 that the proletariat must not lose its hard-won independent position and be reduced to a mere appendage of official bourgeois democracy. That doesn't rule out participating in such a, uh, a party, but it does rule out lowering your banners and withdrawing the class independence of the working class in, the favor, in favor of the petty bourgeoisie. The task at all times is to expose the prevaricating, cowardly position of the petty bourgeois leaders and replace them with a clear-sighted, proletarian, revolutionary leadership. And I think you can see the petty bourgeois nature of the social democratic leaders very clearly today. But I should move on. Um, I would echo Rob Sewell's recommendation that you buy the Chartism book by Rob Sewell. Uh, and I would also uh, completely agree with what he says, that this is not an academic pursuit. If you want to understand the Egyptian revolution of 2012, the Sudanese revolution of uh, when was it, 2019, 2020, the Lebanese revolution, which frankly is still ongoing, then study 1848. Obviously, don't just only study 1848, also study the, the countries involved. But as I said already, the logic of the modern revolution is contained in Marx's analysis of that, those revolutions already for us, which is why it's so stunning and despicable when you see Marxists in history or today who willfully ignore or somehow forget the profound lessons that have already been written down and presented to us. Like Pauski, the so-called Pope of Marxism, who in the German Revolution started talking about combining Soviets with a bourgeois democratic republic under a bourgeois constitution. It shows that being a Marxist is not just about reading Marx. You have to be a revolutionary as well, which is not just a question of theory, but of will. You have to be prepared to be a minority of one sometimes, to stand up against the, the fury of the entire establishment and be prepared to suffer and put yourself at risk, which is what Marx did. But I should move on. Um, I'm grateful to Jacopo for his fascinating intervention on the Roman Republic and the, the treacherous role of the so-called liberal Pope, Pius IX, or Il Papa Porco, as the Italians called him after 1848. I wonder what will happen to today's liberal Pope. It may be too that he will unleash forces beyond his control. I look forward to finding out. But another thing that uh, Jacopo's intervention made me think about was the hypocritical and treacherous role of the French so-called republic. And this gives us another useful comparison between the French, the position of the board, French bourgeoisie in 1848 and in 1789. 1789, although it's really 1792. In, on the 19th of November, 1792, the Jacobin Convention uh, issued a, a declaration promising that the new French Republic would, and I quote, grant fraternity and assistance to all peoples who wish to recover their liberty. And they backed it up as well. What did the Second Republic have to say to the peoples of Europe? Lamartine, the head of the provisional government, 
who was also a very famous poet, issued a declaration of alliance and friendship to all nations. He explained that in France in 1848, or sorry, under the Second Republic, there are no distinct and unequal classes, and therefore the Republic will not commence war against any state, even Tsarist Russia. And to Italy in particular, Lamartine offered the following. If the independent states of Italy should be invaded, if limits or obstacles should be imposed on their internal changes, if there should be any armed interference with their right of allying themselves together for the purpose of consolidating an Italian nation, the French Republic would think itself entitled to take up arms in defense of these legitimate movements towards the improvement and nationhoods of states. Entitled, that is, not obliged. In the end, the French Republic did take up arms and sent them to Italy. By that time, Lamartine was long gone. The, the Republic was now ruled by Louis Bonaparte and the reactionary party of order. And they sent an army to Rome, not to defend the Republic, but to crush the Republic and restore the Pope. Again, on the face of it, a, a, one Republic sending an army in order to crush another Republic and replace it with the medieval regime of the Pope. It just doesn't make sense to me. But again, from a class point of view, it makes perfect sense. De Tocqueville was actually the foreign minister at the time that famous liberal, and he said the following, it was not possible to support them, the Romans, abroad without falling beneath their blows at home. The contact of their passions and doctrines would have put all France in flame. This perfectly sums up the reactionary role played even by the Republican bourgeoisie in 1848 to 49. And it completely confirms what Marx said, that neither Hungarian, nor Pole, nor Italian will be free as long as the worker is a slave. Only a victory of the working class in France could have provided the foreign support the Roman Republic needed. And tragically, tragically, that was not possible at that time. Or well, perhaps the temporary victory of the working class was possible at that time, but it was not forthcoming. I found Gernot's inter uh, intervention on Austria very interesting. And it shows the leading role, the important role of the working class, even when the working class was very tiny in Austria. Austria was backward even compared to the rest of Germany. And in the detail that Gernot gave us, uh, we can flesh out a bit the, the relationship, the, the kind of the, the interesting relationship that developed between the radical students in Vienna and the working class. Um, at least at the, the beginning of the revolution, the workers actually looked to the students as their leaders. At one point, when the government moved against the students, the railway workers went on strike and started actually pulling up the rails. And it's, in October 1848, the workers and students fought side by side. But even in this quite positive example, you can see the seeds of a future split and the need for permanent revolution. Whenever the workers put forward their own class demands, like asking for higher wages, often the students would lecture them on the need for all classes to make sacrifices for the revolution. And like Mazzini in Rome, they saw their role as effectively combining the interests of the bourgeoisie, who hated the revolution, and the workers, without whom there would be no revolution. It is likely, had the revolution survived the October attack, that eventually the students would have turned their back on the, uh, on the workers just as the French students abandoned the workers in June 1848. Medical students even refused to treat injured workers during that battle. Today, I still encounter some student activists that seem to have a similar attitude and behave as if it's their job to tell the workers what to do. And these people are much less courageous than the Viennese students of 1848. But as we saw in May 68, it's the workers and not the students that should lead the revolution today. Now, Rob Lyon made a number of important points. And I, uh, there was one that I wanted to repeat, but I don't think I'm gonna have time to develop, that when a historically necessary task is not carried out by the revolution, it can still be carried out by the reaction. But the, the conquest of that historic task by the reaction, if anything, actually intensifies the contradictions in the country. Germany was unified not by the workers or by the bourgeoisie, but by the Junkers, the cabbage Junkers, as Engels called them, Kraut Junkers in German, I think. And the contradictions at the heart of that regime laid the basis for the German revolution. Today, the unification of the whole of Europe is an historically necessary task, an historic necessity. Trotsky hoped that it could be achieved by the working class in the United Soviet States of Europe. Instead, it has been attempted by European finance capital. And look how well that's going. And I'll tell you this, it's making a Europe-wide revolution like 1848 more, not less likely. But the most important point that Rob made, in my opinion, was about the need for an independent party of the working class. What I hope has come out of the discussion, particularly in relation to France, is that different layers of the working class and different layers of society move at different speeds. A party is needed to ensure the vanguard does not become separated and is destroyed before the reserves arrived. Look at Blanqui in the clubs. He was, without question, the most outstanding leader of the French proletariat. He understood the need to overthrow the provisional government in a second revolution. And he had a revolutionary club with thousands of members 
and a lot of authority within the movement. But this was no Bolshevik party. And on May the 15th, 1848, Blonky and his followers got arrested, launching an ill-timed and isolated insurrection. What a waste. The, the leader of the French proletariat spent the decisive June insurrection in jail. And he made exactly the same mistake again in October 1870. To defend his own revolutionary prestige, he got swept up into an isolated, unprepared insurrection. 29 so he minutes. spent the Paris Commune in jail. Incorrigible. The truth is that the French workers in 1848 did, have not, did not have time to build a disciplined, centralized party of the proletariat. What they did achieve was, in that time was miraculous. But it was not enough. We do have the time to build this party, and we are laying the foundations now. Future revolutions will throw up similar processes. Even with a strong Marxist tendency in the movement, the entire working class is not going to immediately grasp the need to dismantle the bourgeois state. This takes time in the course of the struggle. But if the masses are forced to learn the same lessons from scratch again and again, then they will be defeated. The Revolutionary Party is the memory of the working class. And we must learn the lessons of 1848, 1871 and 1917 in particular to resist the enormous opportunist and ultra-left pressures that will apply in the course of the revolutionary movement. But it's not uh, enough to have a correct policy. Marx and Engels had the correct policy in relation to France, but their organisation was, in Marx, in Engels' word, too small a lever. Now, Archimedes apparently said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I will move the world. Comrades, with these ideas and with the perspectives we discussed on Saturday, we know where to stand. And this organisation, the IMT, is our lever. But it's not big enough. We need a big lever if we're going to move the world. Let us turn the 7,000 registered to this event into 70,000 Marxist cadres and more. And with it, we will move the world.